with some other guests, I have to hand you back to studio because what is happening here is really, really unthinkable. Oh, well, thank you so much, Stephen BD, for alarming us on the disaster that is on our roads. Uh, my colleague Chris now has names for every big pothole within the city of Kampala, and he calls it Lake. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at that. Anyway, um, Lake X Street and, and others. But uh, a, a friend of mine actually almost lost probably a leg or even a life if it could have been that fatal uh, because of those open manholes within the city. And so it's quite disturbing that uh, people can comfortably sit in their offices and not be able to have that much enforcement to see which manholes are open and get to cover them up. But they have enough enforcement to milk Banakampara of their money. But it is what it is. At the end of the day, we still have to be prepared for things such as disasters and manage them properly. How do we do that? Well, in our Kickstarter this morning, we're going to be looking at Uganda's ability to be disaster prepared and how we get to manage it on own and as every occurrence and every frequency. My name is Priscilla Regina Naloga, and again, thank you so much for being with us here in morning at NTV. Now, to just give you a backbone of it, with the increase population growth we are going into the census in a few meaning that the statistics are going to change drastically the rapid and planned urbanization as you can see from what Stephen Bide has shown us the cost of human activity on our drainage systems when you look at climate change environmental degradation as well as the widespread poverty a growing number of people and assets are exposed to disasters without a doubt moreover many of these events are actually occurring in fragile and conflict of affected areas, thus increasing the complexity of the crisis and overburdening the country, experiencing violent uh, um, capacities in terms of development by government, uh, response, recovering in terms of uh, aiding the affected areas, the communities, the individuals uh, who are uh, equally affected also, being in anticipation of how can they respond, are they prepared to respond, are they ready to recover, are they capable of recovery. So all those nitty gritties are definitely something as a nation we definitely have to deal with. Now we do have a new Minister for Disaster Preparedness for us here in Uganda, um, Minister Lillian Aber. And so uh, a lot awaits her docket of responsibility. However, you do have collaborative organizations that have uh, joined uh, hands with the government of Uganda uh, to be first-hand respondents to some of these disasters. For example, the Uganda Red Cross Society, to whom we're privileged to have this conversation with. Dr. Brian um, Kanahe gets to join us. He is the Director, Disaster Risk Management with the Red Cross Society of Uganda. Dr. Brian, you're most welcome. Thank you, Priscilla. Okay. Now, let's start off with a general look of 2023 and the disasters that we had to deal with, especially on your side. Which were the most eminent disasters that you dealt with and how many people were affected? Which communities were affected? And when you look up back to them now, has there been recovery and restoration? Uh, thank you. <coughs> thank you again and uh, good morning to our... Uh, viewers and listeners. Um, so just before I answer that question is, uh, I just want to also state that you see the Uganda Red Cross is uh, the first responder um, and auxiliary to government of Uganda. So our job is to support the public authorities to ensure that uh, rapid assessments are conducted on time. Um, and when you have those rapid assessments, then the government and all the other responders can be able to make appropriate decisions. Mm. So now back to your question. Uh, 2023 was a very interesting year in the history of disaster management in this country because uh, we dealt with both what we call hydromet disasters, disasters that come as a result of water, you know, mm. uh, too much water, and also, we also had uh, pandemics, you remember? So we had the uh, uh, Mobende, uh, you remember, where we're having uh, the Ebola outbreak. Uh, but also, most importantly, we had uh, mudslides in Ergon region, uh, 
and then uh, western part of the country and also the north part uh, where we had the flooding in Elegu. Now, the people who were mostly affected uh, were, the, were coming from Ergon region uh, and that's not a surprise really because this is one of, it is the most vulnerable um, region in part of, uh, part of the country mm -hmm. and uh, the people who majorly were highly affected were majorly children uh, of school going age uh, people living with special need, with disabilities um, and also we cannot forget that we had also cases of urban flooding especially in the, all the cities, the new cities that we have, we had cities, including the one we are living in today of Kampala. Mm. Okay, so that's quite interesting. Disaster, looking into disease, outbreaks, you talked about the hydro disasters, and of course uh, within our city here in Kampala. When we look at 2024, January, February, March, we are now in Apple. Which are some of those disasters that you've had to give first responders to so far? Thank you. So let me start with the latest one, which uh, happened uh, the last night um, again, because you see when an emergency happens, it doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. uh, to say now, uh, okay, I have hit this community for three hours, I'm done, let me go to sleep. No. So we had uh, uh, two, d uh, two days ago um, uh, flooding in Chisoro. Were, where uh, Chibumba Primary School oh. uh, was uh, flooded again mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it's, it happened also last year. Um, and uh, the district and the Uganda Red Cross have been able to do a rapid assessment and 125 people, uh, households, 125 households, and each household on average we estimate that they have six people. They have six people. So that we have people there who have been affected, and as I, we talk today, that school has closed. They are not having education. Mm. Uh, and so far what, uh, what we have done, uh, the rapid assessment has been done, and in partnership with the Office of the Prime Minister, we are going to give core relief items, you know, majorly household items, but also we are going to deploy um, uh, two uh, uh, flood uh, shelters, those are shelters we call them disaster mobile shelters, mm -hmm. to position them around the safer schools, safer areas of the school, such that it, especially for children in upper primary, they can continue up with their education. Mm -hmm. Then uh, more also, uh, this now on over the weekend, uh, on uh, Sunday, we supported uh, Buikwe district. Buikwe, Somebody would say, hey, what is happening? No, Buikwe is not that vulnerable. No, you see, because of this season, this is April. April is forecasted by Yunma to be uh, the wettest month mm. of the March, April, May. So, you know, in this country, you have March, April, May forecast, uh, where we expect lots of rains. And then the September, October, November, December, mm -hmm. when we call the sun, where also we expect. So, April is going to be, uh, and it is already showing those the signs. Hmm. So Buikwe, we supported Buikwe with uh, 100, uh, one, uh, 100 households that were displaced, you know, strong, uh, very affected. Uh, you know, we classify them, those who are affected, those who are displaced. Mm -hmm. the, so the most vulnerable households, they were given relief items as well. Uh, then uh, the, the, at the beginning of last week, uh, on, man, on, on Wednesday, we supported uh, Brambuli and the Butareja, mm. where, uh, where 130 households also received support. And in Butareja, uh, the, uh, we had uh, 121 as well households receiving support through uh, Mart Papa's cash transfer. That Ergon region, we've, done, we've collaborated strongly with other partners like Oxfam, uh, CRIS, that is Catholic Relief Services, um, and, and Caritas uh, Tororo. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, uh, that's definitely a lot of work on your hands, especially as first respondents. And it begs the question, uh, there are areas that are commonly known to mm -hmm. have 
that risk that any time the rains come down, areas like Chisoro are expected to be having the slides and the flooding as you refer to them. And so it begs the question, how do you do the disaster risk management for such areas? How do you do disaster risk management for these areas? It's a challenge for all of us. Um, but the first one is, uh, you see it in t major three major areas. You have policy, you have practices, you have investment. So mm -hmm. I can start with, on the policy side, I would like to say that as a country we are very good. Um, because uh, disaster management in this country, we have a disaster management policy uh, developed with, um, through, and through the office of the Prime Minister that you know, prioritizes and mentions who does what in an emergency or even for preparedness. Which, which ministry is in charge of, um, of, of, of supporting the response, what is the role of education, what is the role of ministry of agriculture. Every ministry there, every public authority has a role there, even the role of the private sector and the media like uh, mm -hmm. MTV. Mm -hmm. So in an emergency, in disaster risk management of these areas, there is no problem. Then in terms of um, uh, what are those areas where you should invest from? This country also has a National Disaster Risk Management Plan mm. approved in 2022. Mm. And it talks about uh, what are those areas. In, if you're going to do disaster risk reduction, what are those technologies? We talk of crime and smart agriculture, which is about long-term planning. You talk about um, anticipatory actions that is acting bef up before an emergency happens, which mm. means you need to forecast. And that is, means you have to work with uh, specialized agencies like the MET, then you know that this area is going to be flooded, then you preposition response and so on. Mm. But then you also, this country has a, 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 what you call the National Risk and Vulnerability Atlas. Now I answer your question. Because the National Risk is a map. National Risk and Vulnerability Atlas is a map um, that shows that this, if you, the, 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 number one, it shows, of course, Ergon region is the most vulnerable. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't stop there. It also goes to the district and say, which district? And then it also, which districts? Mm -hmm. then In the it, district, it, now which sub-counties? And now sub-counties mm -hmm. and also goes to the villages. Mm -hmm. And with that, it helps us to know what we call impact-based forecasting, which is about, if you say this is sub-county is the most vulnerable. In case of an emergency, um, how many people are there that and livelihoods that could potentially be affected. be affected. Yeah, so on the policy side, there we are. But to answer your question, on investment, how do you do, how do you prioritize yeah. the little resources you have to do this? So we've, we've been able to work with the government of Uganda and out of the 40 highest risk districts, we have now uh, 21 districts with marked hazard contingency plans. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very, very effective tool if operationalized, of course, but it's a very good tool that prioritizes and shows that rock disasters have to be managed, planned for and responded to at mm. the local level. Mm. If there is need, for, maybe we can talk of need for funds or, um, or, or, or technical support special person, personnel, but this tool is there already, mm -hmm. which means that if there is any other agency that wants to work in a certain district, in disaster management, they should just get this Bible of disaster man preparedness and mm -hmm. response and say, the, we will maybe run away with education, support education in emergencies, should, it, should an emergency happen. But there is still more work to do, of course. That's just half. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you've talked about the policy side where you say, as far as policy is concerned, the structures there, they're quite clear. Uh, mm. The roles and uh, which our office is meant to be playing that particular role. Of course, you've also talked about the investment. Let's talk about the practices. Mm -hmm. um, practices both on uh, the affected person side or affected community side, but also on government side. So what are some of those practices that are in place currently that are helping with disaster management and preparedness for us as a country. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Let me start from the public authority where we are partnering with the government of Uganda. Um, we are partnering with the government of Uganda. Uh, government of Uganda gives us uh, funding, uh, some little funding uh, that um, uh, helps us to conduct these rapid assessments. 
Yes, because uh, as, a, as, a, as a national society, we, can, we may not be able to get or funding even from our international partners to cover the whole country. Mm -hmm. So we have a five-year ongoing or collaboration with the government of Uganda where we, we get some annual funding through their budget allocations to be able to support that rapid assessment and deployment of emergency um, supplies as required. But also uh, with the private sector, we've but we are having uh, even pre-crisis agreements with a number of private sector agencies who give us all this relief that mm. we get that you see being given. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's uh, really, really appreciated from our side. Mm -hmm. Now, on the community side, the practices that we see, number one is about to, we are seeing communities, when they get this information, they are able to just get their sanitation digging kits and they are able to open up drainage channels on their own. Most of them have been trained in uh, prepositioning sandbags along rivers. Mm, yeah. Then we have community radios. I can mention FM radios too, but we say having um, in this country so far in uh, this, in Ergon, um, uh, West Nile, and uh, southwestern Uganda, that is in particular Kasese, we have cumulatively 18 community radios functioning. Mm. And these, uh, these 18 community radios are able to give um, and disseminate, uh, uh, provide early alerts to the communities to move and so on. So you can ask me, but then what happens at night? Uh, so we are pre-testing also one very good technology of using what you call uh, terrestrial sensors um, those are put in the water and mm. they are able to send some alert messages to the community radios even though it's at night then the community radio people can also send those messages. Mm -hmm. Those are key investments so far that are help us, uh, helping us to improve. Okay, all right. So you talked about uh, the disaster preparedness uh, plan 2022. What does mm -hmm. it entail and why do I ask this? Mm -hmm. uh, because on this side we keep asking ourselves the question of but we know that these are the hot spots of yeah. disaster year in, year out. And COVID-19 was a good eye opener for so many of us that mm -hmm. as Africa, maybe by and large, uh, we respond, we react and not proact. You know, <laughs> whereas the Western world, yeah, it had its vaccine check somewhere. If anything happens, they're good to go. They can start with this and this as they, you know, manufacture this and the other. But for <coughs> us here in Africa and in Uganda, we continuously see that we have to wait for the disaster to happen, then we respond. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. So, yes, uh, you are right uh, that for a while uh, the main focus has been on the response side um, but why is that the case and why is that the case and i can relate it to the national uh, disaster management uh, plan mm -hmm. of 2022 signed the 20, uh, 20 signed 2022 mm -hmm. The disaster management plan talks about key areas of investment, which is around the, what we have always called, uh, you know, adaptation, um, mitigation, uh, coordination, uh, and then what are those practices? For example, um, work, how do you work with young people to create awareness on uh, not just awareness and response on climate induced disasters mm. what would be the role of the private sector uh, if you are going to plan a, a, a disaster preparedness program what should it look like strengthening community structures mm. equipping um, equipping uh, uh, first responder kits um, all that and it costs them mm. annually for this country mm. annually so it means that people like us who are coming from the Ghana Red Cross and other agencies, if you're going to design a disaster preparedness program, which should be comprehensive in nature, mm -hmm. go to that document, pick out the three few areas, mm -hmm. see, because they're already costed, mm -hmm. and then work out your proposal, whatever it is, and then uh, go and implement. Mm -hmm. So, but on the response side, and I like your question. It's been, yeah, so relax, and then, oh, the, the, the response has because happened. Because you, you know that meteorological center has told yeah. you, yeah. 
much apple may yeah you know it it's it yeah. <laughs> by default setting yeah. you also know that chisoro is a hot spot yeah and you know that there are communities there whose lives will be disrupted yeah. and so it begs the question if they their lives are going to be disrupted for these three months why yeah. not have a contingency plan that then prepares them between january and february so yeah. that by the time the disaster comes they are safe and therefore there's less need for fast responders because you have already acted uh, rather than reacting in the heat of the moment yeah that's uh, it's ongoing I mean it started uh, uh, way back uh, 2015 uh, where Uganda Red Cross piloted what we call a focus based financing mechanism mm -hmm. which is acting before an emergency happens and indeed it is the working philosophy is that it is working with based on the available forecast very good forecast, then you go and pr prepare the communities. That is, you, you give them training, you give them awareness, work with the local district and local partners. We have done that. And the challenge, the challenge is that most in, in, the, in the field of disaster management, there is unpredictable and usually short-term funding. Mm. Okay. Yes, that's that's number one. Mm. Um, again, unpredictable and short-term funding, of which it is easier to find some, and that funding becomes only available during the emergency, and that's why it, first it responders becomes easily are, accessible yes. when there is an emergency. But if there's no emergency, you're going to sit in meetings after meetings, convincing all stakeholders that you need to have an earlier plan. No, that's it. Number two. It is also that you see working in before an emergency happens is, mm -hmm. is probabilistic. Mm. Uh, it is probabilistic. It's uh, based on a forecast that could be maybe 60% um, depending on, on, the, on, the, on the time for the incident to happen. And that 60% is enough to have preparedness because at the end of the day the magic words are the preparedness of you know communities preparedness of the public officers the preparedness of yourselves as an organization an NGO in dealing or averting the situation yeah hydromet disasters can be forecasted up to a 30 day lead time mm -hmm. that we can know from now that 30 days from now is it's going to be yes yeah. a peak but even then and that brings me to the third point, which is about the mindset of us as humanitarians and actors, because our mindset also must change. And I would like to think that it has been changing at least since for the last about 10 years, mm -hmm. where now we are having even a number of dialogue events every year that we call the national and special dialogues. Mm. And we talk about what are those technologies what is the cost of not acting in, uh, or in what is the cost in terms of preparing and what is the cost of responding of course when you're responding you use more costs in there so there is um i would say there is some improvement over time but we need to address these three key issues okay all right so in that regard uh, what has been the response of government um in regards to having that nature of preparedness being streamlined and uh, given more attention than the you know the rapid assessments that you have to go through when a disaster has happened and that uh, first responders you have to give what has been government's ear towards that uh, preparedness has been a, and continues to be an essential part of the country. Uh, there is already discussion, you may have heard of it, about uh, disaster risk financing of the country and also the climate risk financing of the country, which is spearheaded by the government of Uganda, actually. There are a number of steering committees in place, including the Anspecian uh, Steering Committee of this country, again, uh, um, uh, chaired by the government. So it's trying to put in place enabling policies, especially for us, to be able to, as first responders, to be able to be more efficient. But also you can see there are already discussions in terms of how the emergency fund at the Ministry of Finance and Planning and Economic Development is being uh, change, it is being it, it's being operationalized in terms of being available for preparedness, not just for response. So mm -hmm. th that whole discussion is taking place. Is it at a faster rate? Could it be at a faster rate? 
yeah, it would be good for it to be faster. Mm -hmm. Okay. You also mentioned something about multi-hazard contingency plan. Yeah. What entails that plan? And uh, in terms of execution as a you know, first respondent and auxiliary to government, how applicable has that plan been for you? Um, so what is entailed in it? The multi-hazard contingency plan uh, talks about it, it is for each district. So let's say uh, Kasese district. Oh, so it's customized. Yes. These plans are customized to the hotspots. Uh, to, okay. to, yeah. Then if uh, Kasese district, then which sub-county, uh, what are the areas that are mostly affected uh, usually, but also by what, which hazard? It could be flooding, it could be pest and diseases, it could be animals that are coming f from uh, the, wild, uh, wild, the national parks. It could be that this area is uh, um, prone to uh, other health concerns, mentioned road traffic crashes, pandemics, malaria, and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's multi-hazard in nature that it is both disasters and it is also the health component, but also the health component that we have like now foot and mouth disease. Yes. So and, and, uh, diseases that uh, come from uh, animal, the animal section. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what it is. Then. What has been our experience? Mart hazard contingency planning is one of it is the it is one it, I wouldn't say the one but it is the most important tool for disaster response. Without mm. that plan, you're going to run to the same area. You find you're going to respond with the same things probably to people who don't need them. It it, it mentions roles and responsibilities, um, and most importantly, areas of funding. So our, plan, our experience has been that this is a very essential tool, one, for fundraising, because if you're going to go to any private partner, it's going to say, but you are not the only actor in there, and which is true. What is the other partner doing? So that's one. But also, you see, multi-hazard contingency plans, they, when you simulate them, it gives us an opportunity to simulate them. Mm. Do these type of plans in absence of an emergency. Just imagine this is going to be an emergency and then simulate. It keeps communities and, um, and, um, and the other actors alert and aware of the disaster risks in their districts. Okay, so we've talked about, you know, uh, your part. We talked about the government's part. Uh, let's... Uh, Paint for us the picture on the side of the communities, uh, mm -hmm. especially the ones that are in those 40 di districts with the natural risk uh, and uh, vulnerability, the atlas. What does it look like for them? How, what is their perception and has their mindset now adapted to the fact that during these particular times of the year, we have got to consider maybe relocating or doing A, B, C, D as recommended uh, by your work and your office in regards to averting disaster? There has been, a, a, from our experiences as first responders in the country, uh, there has been a significant improvement in terms of uh, the perception of risk by communities, especially during the, such seasons. And um, before it was, mm, yeah, the, the forecast stories comes and nothing will happen, or we will manage. But this time, people have, in, uh, the perception has increased, and they know that it happened last year. Mm -hmm. it, there is a very good chance that it will happen this okay. year. So in terms of risk, uh, perception, risk perception, people are aware. In terms of people getting messages, and because uh, when you talk about things like, uh, storing up food. The problem is where the stores, if we, if we, whether they are public stores, because they are not really public stores where they can store food. But at household level, you find people actually trying to save um, the food that they could use during the, the rainy season. We see people taking up climate smart agriculture practices along the way and looking at flood, uh, planting um, drought resistant uh, crops. Uh, embracing flood resistant shelters, people improving up their, their, their huts mm. that they are living in, in the local communities, by putting, uh, it could be stones, could be sand, but raising the floors up. Um, we are seeing up uh, people uh, in the local communities forming village savings and loans association groups. Mm. Now those, that is the economic safety nets and 
and uh, those, what is interesting is that they are using even those funds, uh, the proceeds from those funds, not just for their livelihood improvement, but also for fixing community radios. Mm -hmm. because so we don't them. have to pay for mm -hmm. the community radio. The communities are doing that on their own. Okay. All right. Well, it's quite interesting the role that uh, you know you are playing as the Uganda Red Cross Society. This conversation is going to be continuing right after this break. It is our Kickstarter, and we do continue the conversation on Uganda's preparedness as well as management with Dr. Brian Kanahi, who is the Director for Disaster Risk Management with the Uganda Red Cross Society. And of course, where we started from, he alluded to us the fact that there's rapid assessment, there's government response as well as appropriate um, decisions that have to be made in order to be prepared as a country for disasters. And he also talked about uh, three elements that actually contribute to a country's readiness. He talked about policy, in which he assured us that as far as policy level is concerned, we are good to go. Uh, he also did make mention of practices, uh, both on the public side, the you know NGOs like the Red Cross Society, as well as the community that have been adopted over the course of time, and the quest for investment the end of the day that's the biggest area that needs to be focused on investment in aiding this country be prepared and uh, he told us that I mean we do have the ability to prepare ourselves way before the disasters come through with the realization of the you know the disaster management plan that we have 2022 the national risk and vulnerability atlas that does exist to inform them of course there's uh, the forecasting that is also helpful and the multi-hazard contingency plans that do exist for each of the 40 districts that are prone districts for disaster and at the end of the day it's all about adaptation meeting and coordination. However, it still begs the question, what are the fundamental roles of the stakeholders and who they are? Dr. Brian. Uh, thank you again. Um, <clears throat> so the majorly, the key stakeholders in disaster response is literally everybody. Uh, the communities first, uh, the people who live in these disaster prone areas, uh, because uh, now this is a season where you have to continue listening to all the advisories coming from the government at, uh, through your local district, also from the Red Cross first responders who are giving this early warning information, um, and the district disaster uh, management committee, that whole team, that when they come to visit, they do assessments, they want to talk to you, it should be available and be able to give information to, for example, there could be new information that has happened right now, maybe a new crack mm -hmm. that you have seen when you were going to the, to the, to the fields. Um, so that should be, um, I would encourage that we continue like that. But then also the, on the issue of, um, on, for other partners, uh, especially uh, government of Uganda, the main role would be to, and they are playing it already through a coordination, uh, convening emergency task force meetings in the country depending on thresholds because th those meetings take place either at the district level through the disaster management committee or here in Kampara the for, at the office of the prime minister uh, when depending on which thresholds for the emergency and they are already in in touch we are in touch they are doing they are doing that but also the 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 UN bodies they we cannot forget the UN family how it is supporting um, it is, we are working through, the, uh, the, the UN family is also working through us. Mm -hmm. uh, when we get these assessments, we give them also the UN family such that they can mobilize uh, support mm -hmm. uh, to these local communities. But f especially for all of us, it's, um, this forecast is affecting the whole country when you look at it. And in all these regions, this country has regional warehouses. Where there is, as we talk, there is an active regional warehouse in Mbari, we have here in Kampala, we have one in Soroti for Teso region, we have uh, in where, two warehouses for Western Nile. For Western Uganda, we have in Fort Poto, we have another one in Barara for Southwestern and Kisoro. 
what is important is um, uh, that whatever form of support is available to provide life-saving infrastructure, the core relief items, we are able to mobilize them, uh, head to the core, because if, and if, they, if the trend continues, we are going to have to make a, a call mm. to the country for provision of these items, and so we would be happy to restock to stock these items, preposition them, such that uh, all the help that we can get can reach to the most uh, vulnerable people as fast as possible, not yeah. just having them in Kampara, they should be closer. Okay, well that does make sense, especially for a year like 2024, for which we're not sure which season we are in, because <laughs> it's pretty much been a rainy season from the beginning of the year <laughs> to debt. And so it begs the question, is there a fundamental transition in our climate uh, as far as you know Uganda is concerned? But as we move into that conversation, I know that as stakeholders, there is a national dialogue that is coming up next month. So um, you, as the Uganda Red Cross Society of Uganda, is, you're part of this dialogue. Tell us more about this dialogue. What is it intended to do? So thank you. Uh, this is the second national dialogue on anticipatory action. In simple English, let's say it is a dialogue, it's, it's a meeting where we are bringing together all key partners in the country, um, working with government of Uganda, uh, Veru and other UN partners, uh, can mention FAO, uh, WFP, uh, MET is going to be part, and we have other private sector also joining. Mm -hmm. um, agencies like other NGOs like uh, Oxfam, uh, they're also joining up this discussion. It is to answer the, quest the questions that you have actually asked me, which is about one, how do we make funds available for first responders mm. in, before an emergency happens? So this is the second, it's a build up from the first dialogue that took place in 2022. Um, then we want number two, to take, tr to take stock of, in 2022, when we had this meeting, we had a clear roadmap that talked about having a steering committee in place and investing, deliberately investing in communities. So it's some form of accountability stock take mm -hmm. for humanitarian actors and government. What is it practically we have done? Then the last one is to showcase innovations, innovations in place. I've talked to you about the terrestrial river gauge sensors, for example. Now we are talking about machine learning, mm -hmm. potentially drones. How about the air industry, for example? Uh, how, because air, you know, is faster than road. What are those uh, innovations we have to work together with the air industry in this country to be able to deliver rapid relief? Mm -hmm. Then what about the co other collaborations uh, with other ministries, including UPDF, including other specialized agencies of government and communications, how this disaster information, uh, these alerts reach the last household? Okay. All right. So is it open to the public or is the public also allowed to be participatory of this dialogue or it's limited to those stakeholders? So taking place next uh, month, the uh, 23rd, 24th of May, uh, this dialogue is open um, for public and we're already sending out a link where we just want you to register so that we can make appropriate planning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, all right. Planning <laughs> is one of the ways that we can avert disaster. Now, speaking of which, um, I know that uh, it, it is you responsibility to still prepare communities and prepare the public for any form of disaster and it begs the question where you sit right now today and uh, in your office of disaster management and risk management what is your call to action for our audience uh, one is uh, head to the advisories there are a lot of advisories going on that are, or, that have been sent to different radios because the advisory you send in Western and Eastern, different regions is different. Mm -hmm. So government of Uganda and uh, Uganda Red Cross are sending out advisories, um, majorly, so please heed to them. Uh, number two, we already seeing very good progress in terms of risk perception. So when these, when these advisories are sent, be sure to localize them because this is something that is happening and um, it's, uh, it's, it's important that you take local action 
but also lastly, especially for the private sector and um, other, other specialized agencies, Disasters not only affect our lives, they also affect the economic livelihoods, yes. employment, jobs, education, health facilities break down, road infrastructure break down. So it's my call as well to, that, to all the partners that when we convene uh, these action meetings, you send the right people to attend and make decisions for effective response. Okay. And your closing remarks, Dr. Brian? So Your closing remarks? Uh, th thank you again. I'd like to thank you and of course the, the, the NTV as well because this is part of also exercising the communication and creating a lot, a lot and preparing communities as well. Um, I'd like to also say that um, we as a country, this is not just a challenge for Uganda Red Cross and government of Uganda. It is for all of us and collective action is something that we will like to go to run together mm -hmm. thank you. all right well thank you so much dr brian kanahe director with the disaster risk management and that is the uganda red cross society thank you so much for the work that you do to serve our brothers and sisters in the different hotspots of disaster in the country at the end of the day also the stakeholders dialogue that is coming up next month in the middle of may please go over to their social media platforms and make sure that you register to actively participate your voice is important at the end of the day data collected data is informed decisions on the side of government as well as the first respondents such as the Uganda Red Cross Society. That brings us to the end of our Kickstarter this morning. By and large, it's definitely been a good morning. I trust that all this information that has been put forward to you has been informative because our aim at the end of the day is to make sure that you are an informed person who is going to be making informed decisions throughout the 11th of April 2024. On behalf of Chris Igeni and myself, Priscilla, Regina, Naloga, have a good day.